what is, historically, the world's weakest steam locomotive? It's an interesting question. Everyone talks about the most powerful, or the fastest, or the, you know, the top. What about the bottom? What about everything down there? All the stuff that we don't really talk about that often. Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail Cricks, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains just so pathetic. Yep. And today, we are going to talk about, yes, the weakest steam locomotives in history, which was way more of a pain to actually research. And these are just some of them. These probably aren't the actual bottom of the barrel necessarily. Also, just because they're weak doesn't necessarily mean they weren't successful because most of these, in fact, literally all of them, come in the very early days of steam locomotives. Therefore, we hadn't really, you know, pushed the envelope nearly as far as it eventually would get. And back then, what we would view historically as weak, because we have the benefit of retrospect, was fairly strong at the time. So, they worked. In fact, I think all of these were, for the most part, fairly successful with what they were for. So, go figure on that. Also, I'm doing this by horsepower, because, frankly, finding just that on some of these was kind of a pain, let alone tractive effort. That, that was basically impossible on any of these. So, we're gonna just stick with horsepower, and most of them are so low that you, you'll get the idea pretty well. These are five of the weakest steam locomotives ever. The John Bull. Oh, we've talked about this one before. John Bull was actually a British-built steam locomotive, but she operated in the United States. She was used for the first time all the way back on September 15th, 1831, and she became the oldest operable steam locomotive in the world when the Smithsonian Institution ran her again under her own power in 1981. She is indeed still in preservation, and she was built by Robert Stevenson and Company, and purchased initially by the Camden and Amboy Railroad, the first railroad in New Jersey. She was actually numbered, well, number one, and her name was actually Stevens. John Bull was a nickname given to her, and she was actually shipped over in pieces and had to be put back together, based on what the Americans were able to figure out, because we were still new to steam technology back then. It had been pioneered by the British. But we did get her working, and she served the railroad faithfully for many years, officially being retired in 1866. But again, she was preserved as she was deemed historically relevant by the Pennsylvania Railroad, who later acquired Camden and Amboy's assets. They were the ones that sold her to the Smithsonian Institution. What about her ultimate power output, if pushed to the brink? What heights can she possibly reach? 400. Yep, 400. That's her maximum. And I'm gonna be real with you, that's actually higher than I expected. Because as you'll see with the remainder of this list, that, um, that's actually really impressive. The John Bull really wasn't that bad at all for her day. Puffing Billy. Oh, another very historically relevant steam locomotive, because she is the world's oldest surviving steam locomotive, originally built all the way back between 1813 and 1814, through the combined efforts of one William Headley, Jonathan Forster, and Timothy Hackworth. She was built for Christopher Blackett, who was the owner of a coal mine near Newcastle, over in the United Kingdom. She was employed to haul that coal, and she's actually one of three very similar engines that were built, but she turned out to be pretty successful. She did her job just fine, and she remained in service till 1862, when the new owner of the coal mine lent her to the Patent Office Museum in South Kensington, London. Later, that museum would be known as the Science Museum, and he later sold it to them for 200 pounds. And, incredibly, she's not alone. She has a sister, 
Willem Dilly, and she's over at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. Many of the features that went into their design would become very relevant later for further development on steam technology. She was a vertical cylinder locomotive, though she had two of them, one on either side of the boiler. They each drove a single crankshaft that was beneath the frames, from which gears drove and also coupled the wheels, which allowed for much better traction. She did have some early issues, but that was more due to technical limitations. She ran on cast iron wagonway plates, which is great and all, but Billy was eight tons and she was too heavy. She broke them, which actually encouraged opponents of locomotive traction to criticize the whole thing. That problem was fixed by redesigning her with four axles, so the weight was spread more evenly. Plus, with more modern tracks, it became irrelevant. Future locomotives would be far and away heavier than Billy ever could be. She was also only capable of five miles per hour. Not 50, five. That's eight kilometers per hour. So as you can imagine, the horsepower here is not going to be particularly impressive, and it ain't. Most sources aren't clear as to her official horsepower, though it's believed to be roughly 50. Which, I mean, for a very early locomotive, given that she's literally the earliest surviving one, followed up by her own sister, 50 horsepower? I mean, that's alright. That's alright for the early 1800s. She was successful. She worked. She did what she was supposed to do. So like I said when I started this list, this isn't a dig. It's just a fact. In her day, she was plenty strong. Adler, which is German for Eagle. This locomotive was the first one ever to be used successfully commercially for rail transport of passengers and goods in Germany. As you might expect, that of course makes her very historically relevant. She was originally built in 1835 by Robert Stevenson and Company for the Bavarian Ludwig Railway for service between Nuremberg and Firth. She first ran officially on the 7th of December, 1835, and her wheel arrangement was 222. She's often cited as the very first locomotive used by a railway on German soil, but that's probably not completely true. As early as 1816, a steam locomotive was designed by the Royal Prussian Steelworks in Berlin. But that locomotive was never used commercially, and Adler is absolutely the first successfully operated locomotive for commercial purposes in regular use in Germany. So you can't take that away from her. She lasted about 20 years, finally being scrapped in 1858, as, well, many other locomotives had simply surpassed her. In fact, some sources say that by the time she was withdrawn, she was actually the weakest locomotive still operating in the whole of Europe. So, how weak was that? Well, she was actually decently fast at 40 miles per hour, 65 kilometers per hour, but she very rarely operated at that speed. Her actual horsepower rating was 40. Very exciting. But again, in her day, I mean, she was successful. It's just the technology advanced so quickly that she was overtaken within just a couple decades. Sadly, as I said, she was scrapped. She was not preserved, though there are two replicas of her still in existence, and one is considered to be in serviceable condition. So that's something, I suppose. The Best Friend of Charleston. This locomotive is pretty much considered to be the first locomotive to be built entirely within the United States for revenue service, constructed by the West Point Foundry of New York in 1830. She ran for the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company, and though the Best Friend of Charleston as a name was actually unofficial, that's pretty much what everyone calls her, sometimes they just call her the Best Friend. As you can see, she's a very old style locomotive, a 040, and her first run was actually Christmas Day. She was advertised for passengers with the words, on the wings of wind at the speed of 15 to 25 miles per hour. <laughs> oh, to go back to the glory days when that was considered fast, goodness. But she ran well until June 17th, 1831. I actually have an entire video on that particular incident because, well, she has another first. She is the first locomotive in America to suffer a boiler explosion. It's believed to have been caused by the firemen tying down the steam pressure release valve 
because he got tired of hearing it whistle. Which... No, don't actually do that. The resulting blast did kill the fireman, though fortunately no one else was hurt. Some parts of her were later reused to build another locomotive known as the Phoenix, but the best friend herself was obviously completely destroyed. There are some replicas of her still around that you can see in certain museums. And what about that horsepower? How powerful was she? Well, her given horsepower, based on any source I'm able to find, was... six. Six. Not sixty-six. That's it. Some say it may have been as high as eight. So between six and eight, but it's still a single digit. She was not a very strong locomotive is what I'm trying to say. But she was the first to operate in America. And until she exploded, the railway was pretty happy with her. So I guess what I'm trying to say is don't be hating. The Tom Thumb. Finally, I can talk about this locomotive. I'm amazed that she's never appeared on any list, but she just hasn't fit in anywhere. Prior to now, anyway. She was a teeny tiny little vertical boiler locomotive, a 040. Looking at her, she looks like a steam boiler on a cart, and to be fair, that's basically all she was. Technically, she's the first American-built steam locomotive to operate on a common carrier railroad, but she was not constructed for revenue service. Thus, the first American-built to do revenue service is best friend. In any case, Tom Thumb was designed and constructed by Peter Cooper in 1829, specifically to convince owners of the newly formed Baltimore and Ohio Railroad to use steam engines. She was never meant to actually enter revenue service. She was only for demonstration purposes, but this demonstration was very, very, very important. See, back then, the first railroads were little more than tracks on roads, which I recognize sounds a bit on the nose, but that's really what they were. Horses pulled wagons and carriages with their wheels modified to ride on the rails, and trains could not be moved by steam power until the steam engine could be mounted on wheels. England pioneered that technology, and the early locomotives for America were of course imported from England, but we as Americans wanted to build our own. Peter Cooper believed in the technology, and he wanted to demonstrate that not only could we build them here, but also that we really should be using them. Thus, he built Tom Thumb. And by built, I mean kind of slapped together a little bit. She was, she was very much a homemade steam locomotive, but at the time, he really didn't have another option. He had to improvise in many of the design applications. For example, her boiler tubes were made from rifle barrels, and a blower was mounted in the stack that was driven by a belt to the powered axle. She ran on anthracite coal. Cooper's own interest in the railroad was by way of substantial real estate investment in what is now the Canton neighborhood of Baltimore. If the railroad was very successful, it would naturally increase his own property value. So he obviously had a financial incentive, but hey, either way, he was right about this. Testing for her first occurred on the company's future mainline track to what is now Wheeling, West Virginia. The first section of that line linked Baltimore and Ellicott Mills, which is now Ellicott City, along the upper branch of the Patapsco River Valley. Again, on that line, the cars were pulled by horses, but the Tom Thumb was about to change everything. However, people were still very skeptical of steam technology. They didn't think these new fangled locomotives could ever replace horse and buggy. It was to the point that the owners of the Stockton and Company, which is a local stagecoach line, actually challenged the new locomotive to a race over the eight miles, 13 kilometers, between the Relay House and Baltimore. While it is agreed that the race definitely occurred, the exact date isn't clear. Most sources say it was August 28th, 1830, but other sources give dates of August 25th or sometimes September 28th, but it was very late summer in 1830. We know that. The challenge was accepted, even though the Tom Thumb was hardly the top tier when it came to steam locomotive technology, even in her day. Because compared to what some British locomotives were doing at the time, she was vastly under power because she was only a demonstrator, but they still felt that she could pull her weight. Her acceleration and top speed was actually a great deal higher than the stagecoach. She easily outpaced them at first, 
but the belt slipped off her blower pulley. Without the blower, her boiler didn't draw adequately and she lost power, which allowed the horse to pass her and win the race. But even though the horses had won, it didn't matter. The Tom Thumb had clearly demonstrated superior performance. She had a simple mechanical failure that was easily rectified. And B&O wasn't stupid. They knew that Tom Thumb was hardly the apex of the technology, that certain things could be ironed out, and if they were, she was obviously better. They actually outright stopped using horses entirely just the following year in 1831. Tom Thumb is sometimes misquoted as being the world's first steam locomotive, which is very American-centric, thank you for that, and it's wrong, but she was very important for the industry, critically so, because she showed to America how good the technology was, and how much better it could be. Over time, steam locomotives were everywhere, and the railroad network in America built up as a direct result of a simple race between Tom Thumb and a stagecoach. Sadly though, the original Tom Thumb didn't survive. Because she wasn't meant for revenue service, at the time, B&O didn't see a reason to preserve her. Preservation hadn't even been considered at all at that point. Things had only just started, so she wasn't kept around for posterity. Though detailed descriptions were left, in 1892 a wooden model of her was constructed by Major Joseph Pangborn, who often made models of other early locomotives. And then in 1927, the B&O hosted a centennial exhibition near Baltimore titled The Fair of the Iron Horse, and had a replica of Tom Thumb constructed specifically for that exhibition. That replica followed Pangborn's model, and as a result she differed considerably from the original, being larger and heavier, as well as taller. Her blower was also modified, it wasn't in the stack. A much larger blower was mounted on the platform instead to provide a forced draft. But to be fair, that was probably a necessary improvement anyway. Despite not being completely accurate to the original Tom Thumb, the replica still remains on display at the B&O Railroad Museum. They actually list her as operational, and she makes special appearances each year. But wait, I've been talking about all this history involving the Tom Thumb, mostly because I haven't been able to, and I completely lost the plot. How powerful was she? She was so strong, able to outcompete those dastardly horses. What unspeakable power did she possess? 1.4. Not 14. 1.4 horsepower. That was it. That's all she had. In fact, that performance figure comes from the replica, so the actual Tom Thumb may have been even lower. <laughs> it's hard to say exactly, but yeah, she uh, she was not a strong engine by any stretch of the imagination, but again, she was never meant to be. She was meant to show off the technology, and she did that, paving the way for the future of American railroads. And for that, I think we can all tip our hat to her. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131 232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Rero Videos, Hayden DeGrow, Master of Dunn, Lord Hoth 444, The Baxter, that guy with a beard, Mark Holding, Murder Drones Doll, A Person 723, DM Travel Typhoon, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Alfonso Lopuche, Royal Hudson 2860, Icerfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Dr. Racer 78, Ohio Trucker 1, Mr. Sleepy, Matt Weaver, Alaric Jaspers, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, and Hannah Bird. Till next time, this is Darkness and a Bidwell of Fond Farewell.